Question one. Rahman Enterprises and Madonna Enterprises are operating in the same industry segment of locks manufacturing. There is an expectation of improvement in the market environment and a 20% industry, 20% increase in sales for all the industry players going forward. Both companies have an identical scale of operations with total assets deployed of 400,000 and unit sales of 100,000. They sell their products at $4 a unit and incurring a variable cost of $2 per unit and fixed costs of 50000 Rahman Enterprises finances 40% of its assets from equity and 60% from debt. Madan finances its operations 100% from equity, so no debt here for them. Uh, the interest rate on debt for both companies is 8%. The degree of total leverage for the two companies is closest to. Uh, so let's start. We'll uh, pull in our degree of total leverage formula. Uh, and just so let's uh, talk through these variables quick. So we'll start with the top, which is going to be essentially our gross profit. So it's going to be our sales minus our cost of goods sold. They're what the inventory costs us. So we're going to take our quantity, which will be the unit sales. And then we're going to multiply that by what is our uh, gross profit here. So P minus V, price we're selling at, minus the uh, variable cost of the unit, so 4 minus 2. So it's going to be 200000 in our numerator, and that number is also going to fit in right here. Um, so I'll just pull this in to continue talking through that. So we can see here our Q... P minus V is going to be 200000 for both of them. The fixed cost for both, as it mentions here, is going to be 50000 So that's going to be the same for both of them. And that's going to go in that F spot. And then basically where these are going to differ is in the interest costs. Um, so as it mentioned here, Ramon Enterprises goes uh, finances 60% from debt. And Madan has no debt. So Madan isn't going to be paying that 8% interest rate, um, so they're going to have no financial leverage. So right from that, we know that Rahman's um, leverage ratio should be higher than Madan's. Uh, so interest costs here, Rahman end up being that 400000 in total assets. We multiply that by the 60% debt. And then the 8% interest rate to get uh, interest cost of 19200 And for Madonna, it's just going to be zero. So bring this in, and we're going to calculate these, uh, run it through. So we've got that 200000 like we mentioned, um, over the 200000 minus 50 minus 19.2 for Rahman. Gives us 1.5291, uh, round up to 1.53. So it looks like C is going to be our answer. Let's just make sure Madan checks out. Madan, uh, 200,000 over the 200,000 minus 50. No interest costs, so we don't have anything else to subtract. Uh, gives us 1.33. Uh, answer C. Question two. A stock is expected to pay a $2 dividend in one year. The dividend two years from now is expected to be 20% higher. And the stock is expected to sell at $18.25 two years from now, and the required return is 20%. The stock's estimated value, assuming a two-year time horizon, is equal to 17.21, 14.34, or uh, C16. So we're going to be uh, using this formula here, which is basically... Um, going to be discounting all of the dividends that we're receiving in those years and discounting those back to the present value. And then we're also going to be, um, this P here is going to be what we expect the stock, stock to sell at two years from now. Um, so that's going to be our 18.25. So we're going to discount that back to the, um, the present value, um, and those are going to be discounted at that required rate of return in order to kind of tell us what we would be willing to um, pay for the stock. So pulling our answer here, we've got 2 over 1.2. Um, so that's the dividend one year from now. So we're just doing 1.2. 
no uh, nothing raised to the T since it's just one. So that's going to be this two dollar dividend we're receiving a year from now is going to be discounting back to today. Um, and then here we've got two, which is our dividend. And then as it said, we're expecting that dividend to be 20% higher. So our dividend here is going to be two times 1.2. And then we're adding in the uh, price that we're expecting to get as well, since we're going to be getting that in the same time period. And then we're discounting that back by 1.2 squared, um, bringing that back to the present, uh, present time. And we're squaring it because that T is 2 for 2 years. Um, adding those up gives us 16. So I'm going to pull up the... Uh, so, sorry. Check and make sure that's one of our answers, and we see it is C. So we can go with 16. I'm going to show you an alternate way to do this using the calculator. Um, and I think this might be helpful or just kind of show a different way that the calculator can be used. Um, so we're going to be using our cash flow function here. Uh, so we're not getting anything in year zero. So we can um, keep that zero there. And then in... Uh, in year one, we're getting that two. Sorry, I went back to zero. In year one, we're getting that two dollar dividend. So our first cash flow is going to be two. We hit enter, um, and that's just one one time period. And then in our year our year two, um, we said we were getting. Oh, sorry. We said we were getting our two dollar dividend, but twenty or. But 20% higher, so two times 1.2. So that'll be our dividend in year two. And then we're also getting that price um, that we're expecting it to sell at. So 18.25. So we can add 18.25 here. Gives us 20.65. Hit enter. That's going to be our value there. And so then from here, we'll go to our net present value function. And we're going to put in 20 as our I, since that's our required rate of return or the discount rate. Um, hit enter, and then you hit down here, compute, and you can see we've got 16.00694, but obviously round it and you get 16. Question three, which of the following most likely distinguishes a GP from an LP in a limited partnership? A... Both GPs and LPs have limited liability. Um, so this is going to be not correct since LPs are LPs do have limited liability. GPs are going to have um, liability in the partnership, so that makes that one not correct. B, the growth of the business is limited to the competence and integrity of the limited partners. Um, the limited partners are going to be the passive investors in this um, partnership structure, whereas the GP, the general partner, they're going to be the ones working on the growth of the business. Um, so it's more so based on the competence integrity of the general partners. So if this said general partners, then that would be um, a more accurate statement. So that's inaccurate. So we can cross off B as well, it looks like. So let's just check on C, make sure it seems right. A general partner has unlimited liability and manages the business. So that is two things that we um, came to the conclusion on from those first two answers. So this is seeming correct. While limited partners have limited liability but can provide capital or expertise, and that's exactly what the limited partners do. They're providing um, more, I said passive capital earlier, but they can provide some expertise. They can only work in the business for a certain amount of time though before they could be considered general partners and potentially lose their limited liability um but anyway they will have limited liability um and provide the capital so answer c is correct question four which of the following is least likely to influence the value proposition of a firm a relative pricing b target customers or market and c customer service and support. So on relative pricing, um, this could certainly influence our value proposition since our pricing is going to determine potentially the level of services um, or the type of services that we're providing. If we're less or more expensive than a different firm, it might not indicate that we just charge more or less just because um, 
it's probably going to be because our value prop includes some extra or less services than another firm. Um, so we'll cross that off. Target customers or market. Um, this is going to be more important for the purposes of knowing who we want to be selling our services or products to, but isn't necessarily going to directly um, influence or change what our value proposition is to those customers. Um, so this is probably going to be our answer, but let's just make sure we can rule out C first. Customer service and support. Um, these are very important for the, how the customer or clients um, interact with the company, and it's generally going to be a part of the value prop um, to have a certain level of standard and support. Um, so I think we can go ahead and rule out C as well and uh, stick with answer B. Question five, a company is evaluating the possibility of initiating a new capital investment project with an estimated cost of 14 million. The subsequent five year after tax cash flow projections are provided below. So we've got our years here and our cash flows. Compute the net present value using a required return of 8%. So this is gonna be a calculator heavy question. I've already got the numbers punched in here, but I'm gonna pull it up and walk you through it. Um, so we're going to be in here in our cash flows uh, portion. So our cash flow at period zero, this is going to be our where our initial investment is input. So that's going to be um, a minus 14 million since that's a cost. And then so from there, the rest of our cash flows are just going to be input into the corresponding year. And those are all going to be uh, positive values. So we've got 1 million here for the first um, cash flow, 1.2 million, uh, 2.8 million for the third cash flow, 3.2 million, and then lastly, 3.8 million. Once we have all those um, cash flows input, always <laughs> check and make sure you don't have any stray cash flows at the end there from something you were doing before and forgot to clear out. Um, so next we're going to go into our NPV here to calculate our I is going to be that required rate of return of eight. So we'll enter that here and then we just scroll down to NPV, hit compute and we've got minus 4.884 million. Um, and we can see that corresponds right here to, uh, answer a. Question six, a company is experiencing a decrease in market share due to the introduction of cheaper substitute products. As an analyst, you are tasked with forecasting the company's financials. You would most likely expect this market situation, sorry, how would you most likely expect this market situation to impact the company's gross margin? The gross margin is likely to increase, decrease, or stay the same. Um, so as a refresher, gross margin is going to be sales minus cost of goods sold over sales. So it's essentially going to be the um, profit that we're making just on uh, basically just what we're selling our inventory above what we bought it for. Um, so I'm going to pull that in here just to kind of illustrate a little example. I always think this is easy, makes things easier to kind of visualize and do a easy example in your head in order to, to figure out what's going to happen. Um, so if we take for simple numbers, um, we're tasked with, uh, forecasting the company's financial companies are experiencing a decrease in market share due to cheaper substitute products. So what this is going to do is, is, is it's going to be driving down our sales. Um, so if we had sales of 15 before, maybe now we're going to be at 10. So this is going to be our sales number, and then that's also going to show up in the denominator. Um, so if our sales are being driven down due to competition, it doesn't say anything about it changing the uh, cost of our inputs, though. So if our inputs are the same, it's going to be shrinking uh, the numerator number. If our... The denominator is also shrinking, um, but we can see the shrink in the numerator has a little bit more of an effect. Um, so we can see our gross margin here is 0.6667, and then it drops to 0.5 as our sales are decreasing due to that increased competition. Um, so we're gonna go with B, decrease. 
Question seven. Hasib Ahmed is constric- constructing a portfolio based on the investment policy statement of one of his clients who has mentioned a unique constraint in his IPS of investing in the equity of only manufacturing companies that use renewable energy. This constraint is most likely related to which of the following ESG factors? Social, governance, or environmental? Um, So the key here is the constraint is companies that use renewable energy. Um, So this is going to fall under the environmental factor. So we're going to go with C. Social, um, you know, the stuff like this has been politicized so much that it can kind of feel like a social issue, but in reality it's not a social issue. Um, Social issue is going to be something more like restriction on investments related to kind of your moral compass. So maybe that's related to guns um, or pornography or something like that. Um, governance, this, uh, an example of that would be something like workplace conditions or, um, employee treatment, something that falls more on kind of how management is working in the day to day, um, operation of the business. So we can, uh, cross both of those out and we'll stick with C environmental question eight, Rachel green is discussing corporate governance, best practices with her team. Following are two of her statements regarding corporate governance. So we've got our two statements here, and then our question is going to be, which of the, f- the statements mentioned above is or are most likely accurate? We've got both, only one, or uh, both are inaccurate. Both are correct or both are incorrect. Um, so let's dig into these statements here. To avoid wasting shareholders' resources, the board of directors should get management approval before hiring an outside consultant. Um, best practices would, um, indicate that our board should be truly independent. Um, so if they have to get management approval in order to hire an outside consultant, that would kind of indicate that they're not, uh, independent and they're more so dependent on the management team. Um, so we can say that, uh, this is not best practices and it's a incorrect statement. So looking at the answers, we can rule out A right away. Both statements are correct. So now we just need to determine whether number two is correct, and we go with uh, B or C. Uh, Statement two says, a higher number of representatives on the board is better for shareholders as the shareholders' interests will be fairly represented. Um, Higher number of representatives in and of itself doesn't necessarily mean more interests will be fairly represented. Um, If you hire... 10 people uh, that are from more diverse backgrounds and represent different types of um, potential shareholders, this is going to be more a uh, wide range of representation than if you hired 100 representatives, but they're all of the same demographic, net worth, um, social status, etc. So higher number in and of itself isn't necessarily going to lead to more interest being fairly represented. So we can say that's wrong as well. Um, So we will go with C. Both statements are incorrect. Question nine. Carton Company expects to produce 50,000 units of watches for the following year. The selling price per watch is $200. The variable cost per watch is $100. Fixed costs are 3.5 million and interest costs are 750,000. The degree of operating leverage and the degree of total leverage for Carton Company is closest to. Uh, So let's start with degree of operating leverage. Our degree of operating leverage is going to be, again, that kind of gross profit between our inventory and sales. So we're going to take the quantity, number of watches that we're selling, and we're going to take what we're selling our watch for, that 200 and subtract out that variable cost. So that 200 is going to correspond to P and the 100 to V. So that's going to get plugged in down here as well. And then from that in the denominator, we're going to subtract that fixed cost of 3.5 million. Uh, So we pull all that together to uh, show that. So we've got our 50,000 times the 200 minus 100 over 50 thousand times 200 minus 100 again and then we subtract that 3.5 um, 
million fixed costs out gives us 3.33 for the operating leverage. So assuming we think we have this right, we can cross off C here since our operating leverage is here says 6.67. Um, so now let's uh, look at our total leverage. So for a degree of total leverage, the only real difference in the formula is we're going to be look, accounting for the financial leverage as well as that operating leverage that we already had. Um, so we're just going to add a subtraction of that 750,000 interest cost to the end of that uh, formula in the denominator. Um, so we can see when we do that, we get a total leverage of 6.67. Um, so that's going to bring us to answer B. Question 10. Organic Foods is considering a new project in the health-based packaged food segment. An analyst has gathered information about a listed company named Health Farms, which is which is exclusively into the health-based packaged foods business. The following information is available. So on organic foods, they're giving us debt to equity, marginal tax rate, and debt yield. And then on health farms, where we've got debt to equity, marginal tax rate, so same as those two, but instead of debt yield, we've got equity beta, and then market data, risk-free rate of 5%, market risk premium of 7%. So then we've got uh, the weighted average cost of capital for the project is closest to. So we're going to be calculating weighted average cost of capital for the project. For the project, three main inputs we're going to need here are the weights that we have on debt to equity, or debt and equity, which is going to be derived from that debt to equity for organic foods, um, and then we're going to need to get the cost of debt and the cost of equity for organic foods. So starting with the um, weightings here this is going to be the quicker portion of the question um, so we've got 1.5 debt over 1 equity um, so our debt is going to be 1.5 divided by 1.5 plus 1 um, since both of these combined is going to be our total assets so we've got 60% debt um, and then our equity is just going to be the opposite of that so we've got 40% equity so then cost of debt next is going to be a pretty straightforward calculation as well. So we're going to take that debt yield on Organic Foods Incorporated. Um, but we need to account for the taxes there since our interest expense is tax deductible. So our marginal tax rate is 0.3. Uh, so we do 1 minus 0.3 multiplied by that debt yield and we uh, get our 0 0.0875 number. So we're going to be multiplying this uh, by that 60% as a part of our final formula to calculate the the weighted average cost of capital. So lastly here we're going to calculate our cost of equity um, which this is going to be a little lengthier but we'll uh, get through it here. So this is going to be our final uh, the formula we're going to use to calculate that cost of equity. So we've, we're given two of these so we've got the risk-free rate at 5% and we've got our market risk premium, which is 7%. But we are not given equity beta like we were for health farms. So we can't just use health farms equity beta. We've got to find the equity beta for organic foods. Um, so in order to do so, our equity beta formula, um, we need asset beta. And then we're going to use that asset beta and... Um, adjust it basically for our tax rate and debt to equity um, to get that equity beta. So the asset beta can be used more uniformly across the comparable companies and then the equity beta um, adjusts that to compare the companies uh, because they're going to have different tax rates and capital structures. So we're given the equity beta for health farms but we can we have to use the asset beta of health farms in order to get the equity beta we need for organic foods. So we're going to convert this equity beta into an asset beta and then convert that asset beta back into organic foods uh, equity beta. So let's pull in our asset beta formula here. So asset beta, we're going to take the 1.2 equity beta, plug it in here. And then we're going to multiply that by 1 over 1 plus 1 minus the tax rate times the debt to equity ratio, which is going to be 2 for health farms, 
we want to make sure we're using this company's information for all of it. So that gives us our asset beta of 0.55. So now we can take that 0.55 and we can plug that asset beta back into this formula here. So we've got our 0.55 asset beta and then we're going to do 1 plus um, 1 minus the tax rate. So for organic foods that tax rate is going to be 30%. The debt to equity is going to be 1.5. Uh, so we pull that in here, one second, and we see that gives us 1.1275. So this is going to be the equity beta number that we're going to plug in right here. So roundabout way here, finally get to it. So our equity beta is going to be that 5% risk-free rate plus 1.13, we just round up in our multiplication, times that 7% to get 12.9% for the cost of equity. All right, so we have our weightings now up here. So we've got the 60% debt, and we've got our cost of debt, and then we're gonna, so we're gonna multiply those two together, and then we're gonna add that to the equity weighting, which is 40, uh, multiplied by that cost of equity, 12.9%. So we pull that, uh, pull that in here. So we've got the 0 0.6 times 0 0.0875 plus 0 0.4 times 0.129. Uh, we get 10.41 or, or 0.1041 or 10.41%. Uh, we're off just a little bit, but due to rounding, so we'll go with A, 10.4%.